Thanks for joining us today. We're always so encouraged to know that God is using these messages to serve people all across the world. If you have a story to share, we'd love for you to post it in social media using the hashtag tc.cc or send an email to story at the chapel.cc. Also, if you'd like to help support this resource and others like it, you can give online through our website, thechapel.cc, and help us to bring this your way every single week. Enjoy. Amen. Great to see you guys this morning. Whew. Now look, here, here's the deal. I'm not even going to tell you, I'm not even going to tell you, what's the, what's the capacity of this? There's only one way to... That's a little shaky. That's a lot of Cuban sandwiches right there. That's the bottom line. That's pretty good. All right. Here's the deal. Everything in life has a capacity. Wait. Oh, I'm not even going to tell you what the capacity of that is. <laughs> it's not so bad. Everything in life has a capacity. The chair that you're sitting in has a capacity, a weight limit. Everything, even you and I have a capacity level. It's not so bad when it's like, oh wait. It's not so bad when it's like this. It's like, I can move, I can move around a little bit on this. It's not a big deal. I can preach from this, not move a whole lot, even though I gotta talk with my hands all the time. But this has a capacity. What changes the dynamic of the capacity is when I start to do this. <laughs> That's a lot of core strength right there, just so we're clear. It's <laughs> Why are you laughing? It changes the capacity. It's a little different when we start carrying things with us. It's a little bit different when we pick up things on the journey that we were never meant to be, that we're never meant to carry. Amen. And what happens is it changes the capacity limit of you and I. And two or three isn't that bad, but when you, when you start to pick up a lot of stuff, did you say, what did you say, don't? <laughs> makes me mad. Makes me so mad. <laughs> I start to see those little stars. Those little, you need. Hold on. It's it. Hold on. You need to pick up a trainer. You need to pick up your cardio. What happens is it changes the dynamic, the capacity load when we carry things we were never meant we were never meant to carry. All of a sudden it makes the journey completely different. Completely different. Little different when it's like this. Oh, but I start picking up things in my life that I'm not meant to carry. Listen, for the next four, five, I don't know, six, who knows, weeks, we're gonna talk about living an overloaded life. We're going to talk about how we become overloaded with things in our life. <laughs> life has so many things that we need to carry with it. Responsibility, love, grace, forgiveness. But sometimes you and I, you and I, we carry things. <laughs> it changes the capacity God has built us with a capacity for us to carry things in our life. But some of us, we're carrying the wrong stuff, man. Amen. We're carrying the wrong stuff. It's interesting to me when I look at Scripture. John 10.10. 10, I've come to give you life so that it would be drudge around. I've come to give you life so that the older you get, the worse things are. I've come to give you life. So that by your smile and your wonderful attitude, you would win people to God and make them come in his house. 
(laughs) I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Not the life that culture says is life-giving, but what the kingdom of God defines as life-giving. Because if we don't get this principle, we'll walk around overloaded, carrying things, and it'll change the capacity that we have. And life will seem like a drudgery. That's not biblical. We're going to carry some things. Let's carry the right stuff. We're going to learn what things we pick up. Through life, and then we're gonna learn how to put them down. Because that's what we do here. We just don't read scripture, we got the Monday test. Everything we learn and we see in God's word, we're gonna learn how to apply right away in our lives on Monday. How is it that you and I pick up stuff? What, What are some of the reasons we pick up things in our life? What are some of the reasons why all of a sudden I pick this uh, hatred? Why I picked up this appetite, this craving. Why, how is it that you and I, through the journey, (laughs) we just start picking up stuff? I want us to begin by asking, what is overloading us? What is that? There is something we all carry or pick up intentionally sometimes, but inadvertently sometimes. We just pick up something small or big or whatever it is, and all of a sudden it attaches itself to us, and wherever we go and whatever we do, everything we do, God's trying, listen, listen, God's trying to lift us up to the next level. That's what we learned about all summer long. He's trying to lift our lives to the next level. But we got so much stuff attached to us that we were never meant to carry. He can't take us to the next level because we don't know how to put it down. That's what's happening. That's the desire of Christ. I'm going to take you to the next level, but you got to get rid of some of that baggage. So what is overloading us? Perhaps it's unfulfilled expectations. How do we pick stuff up? How does it attach itself to us? (laughs) <laughs> unfulfilled expectations. We, we have this idea, and this was really, really difficult for me to grasp in my life. And I'm going to share with you some of my struggles on some of this baggage that I'll pick up and that overloads me. Unfulfilled expectations. It's just I think things are going to be a certain way, but they wind up not being. They wind up not being a certain way. Listen, I traveled this week. I'm coming back. It's a short flight from where I was to here, to Tampa. It's it's literally a 56-minute flight to get back so I could preach. I'm excited. This is going to be easy. My expectation is it's no problem, no issue. I'm not going to mention the airlines because it would be bad. Delta, okay? (laughs) Okay. We get out on the tarmac, 56-minute flight. We get out on the tarmac, an hour and 15 minutes later sitting there, kill me with a dull butter knife, okay? I'm sitting in the middle seat. Listen, listen, listen. There's a kid next to me. This, this is bad. This isn't gonna. This isn't gonna go good. Since I started it, let's just go ahead. Listen. <laughs> and he's asking 150 different questions. Why is the wing moving? So he's asking. His dad and his mom are behind me. I'm like, hey, you, we can switch so you can. Because I want to get away from the kid. That's, that's the reality. He's just like, why is it that? And then you know how it's hot in a plane and the air comes on and it looks like smoke coming out of the vent. He's asked so many questions that he goes, hey, dad, dad, what's that smoke? I turn around, I go, poisonous gas. (laughs) I don't care. I don't care. I just dropped my daughter off at college. I'm emotional. I cannot be held responsible for the things that I say. I go, poisonous gas. The kid goes, and I go, it won't kill you. It just gives you diarrhea. The dad is laughing, and he goes, dad, can we change seats? 
Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking the flight's going to be easy. The expectations I have are like, woo! Hour and 15 minutes on the tarmac, they figure out that the manifest doesn't line up with the computer. We have to go back to the gate and unload. Check back in. Lord, please. Lord, Lord. We get back out. We go back out of the gate. We have to line up in a single file. Why? I don't know. We just line up in a single file. I'm really good right now. Things are good. We start checking in. We check all the way back in. We get back in our seats. The kid's back sitting next to me. And I look at the dad, and he's like, I'm, I'm worried that they're going to say something. I'm like, mm, okay. They come back. They have to call five or six names and have long conversations. Two hours and 40 minutes later. Let me tell you some stuff that I wanted to pick up. <laughs> My expectation. I got home at 2.30 in the morning. The, the, the expectation that I had on a simple 56-minute flight. I'm disappointed. In my disappointment, I become angry. In my disappointment, I become bitter. In my disappointment, I become terse. And it comes from I had an expectation of how things would go, but they didn't just line up with how I thought they should. Imagine, side note, imagine being Moses. We know the story. Moses, ah, the Red Sea parts. Everything's great. He says, you're going to deliver the Israelite people. 40 years he leads these people. Right at the very end, what happens? They take him to the top of the mountain and they go, look, here it is, the promised land. By the way, you're not going in. <laughs> what? <laughs> All the junk that I went through leading these people? Yeah, brother, you ain't going in. Unfulfilled expectations sometimes create a level, it creates a level of disappointment. And we're going to learn in the next four or five weeks how to put down that disappointment because, listen, unchecked disappointment will lead you to bitterness. What do you mean I'm not going in? You know who I am? I'm Moses. One of the greatest leaders in biblical history. His expectation is that he's leading people to the promised land. Under God's authority of power. No, uh-uh. And you get there and you get to look at it. Hey, buddy, you ain't going there. Sometimes we pick up this baggage from a unfulfilled ex. I thought the relationship was going to go different. I thought I was going to get that promotion. I thought it was the company would treat me different. I thought that relationship was going to be different. Look at this. Hope. I, I, I was hoping to get that. I was hoping it would work out. I was hoping to get that raise. I was hoping my kids would turn out like, I was hoping my grandkids, I was hoping by now to find someone to marry. I was hoping by, hope deferred, meaning pushed away. Deferred, meaning pushed aside. Hope, when it's pushed aside, really creates disappointment. Hope deferred, pushed aside, makes the heart what? Sick. To the, to the Hebrew mind, to the biblical mind, heart. That's where scripture says your heart is the wellspring of life. It's where life comes out of. When something nasty comes out of your mouth, it doesn't mean something caused you to do it on the outside. It means something got in and causing it to come out. What makes the heart sick is when there's, I just had this hope that my marriage would, I just had this hope that, now I'm on this journey, and I only have a certain level of capacity, and now I got this baggage. We get this, this baggage from unfulfilled expectations. We're overloaded in our lives because, listen, you and I, because we live in a world with other what? People. We've been hurt, and we have pain. And when you stand where I stand, and we talk about leadership and raising people up, 
We take very seriously the scripture that Paul says, stir the gifts, because every believer and follower of Christ has a gift that God has given them. Stir the gifts up inside of them. You wouldn't believe the people that are missing abundant life because they never dealt with a pain from their childhood, from a previous relationship, from their upbringing, and it stunts and it stops their spiritual growth because you're trying to get God to work in you and through you, but he can't lift you up because you got too much baggage. And what happens is we pick up baggage because we're o- and we're overloaded because we don't have, we have this untreated pain. And so we don't say a lot when we get hurt. We stuff it or we shut up. We just shut it down. And in shutting, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to make waves. I don't know. It really did hurt my feelings. It really did, man, it blew me away when they said this. It blew me away when they... Bible doesn't ever talk about stuffing it. Bible says, speak the truth in love. What you said and what you did hurt me. What you did and what you said hurt me. You speak the truth in love and we don't and we stuff it and we shut it down inside. And then that begins to form and shape us. That pain that's unresolved instead of God's will and God's Holy Spirit guiding and shaping us, it's hurt and pain that does. And we pick up baggage and we become overloaded because we haven't dealt with untreated pain. Listen, a uh, uh, side note. I didn't say this Saturday night, so maybe it's just somebody here for a service on Sunday needs to hear it. Listen, how you know if someone hurt you? Well, how do you know? I mean, sometimes I just blow it off. I'm not like you, Pastor Q, is going to say everything. Da, 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 da. You have no idea. This has a filter, guys. I know a lot of you are going, that's a filter? Yeah, this is a filter already. You should have saw me before I gave my life to Christ. How you know if you have pain or hurt from someone? When was the last time you prayed for them? Simple. If you can't bring them to God's throne and pray for their good, for their best, for their livelihood, for them to be blessed and moved and shaped and guided by God, you got a little pain from that person. Simple. Simple little test. But we pick up, we're overloaded, we pick up baggage. Because we have this untreated pain. Look at this. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there really is no peace. Because there's this thing inside. It's just eking at me. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to create trouble. I just shut up. I just stuff it. I just don't shut it down. But but there is no real peace because it's stuffed down. The prophet Jeremiah is talking about, he says, they, they are these people that are supposed to come to the church and say, this is some things that the church is doing wrong, but because they wanted to be more accepted by man than tell the truth. Mm -mm. Because they wanted to be more accepted and included by man than tell the truth. They address the wounds like it was nothing, like it was a mere scratch. They... The wounds of my people as though it were not serious. It was like they treated a wound like it was a scratch, but there was really something deeper going on. And we pick up, we get overloaded because we pick up the baggage of hurt and pain and we don't know how to put it down. Uh, We get overloaded from unresolved yesterdays. Something happened yesterday, Saturday, Friday, Tuesday, or Monday where you should have said something to somebody. Hey, don't say that, that's not true. Hey, you shouldn't talk like that. Hey, what you did, what you said, bothered me. Now, I don't know what your issue is with so-and-so, I don't know what that is, whatever that, and it's unresolved. There's this thing, the conversation, the exchange that you had with someone, it, it kind of left awkward, like, are they cool? Are they not? Are they still mad? Are they, I don't, I mean, I think it ended good. I think, I I don't really, will they call? Will they text? I mean, will they, I I don't. And what happens through this unresolved yesterday is we start picking up insecurity. I don't don't know if they still, I don't know if they still care about, I I think they still love me. I think they're fine. I think, I think, I don't know. 
And through unresolved yesterdays, we start picking up baggage. Look at this. In your anger, do not sin. Everyone who is Italian goes, thank you, God. (laughs) It's not anger, the emotion of anger that's sin. It's what you do with an emotion that causes sin. It's in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. The issue, the bigger issue here that, that the Bible is going after is don't let time go by with something unresolved because what it's going to do is cause you to pick something up you were never meant to carry. And in most cases, an unresolved yesterday results in us picking up paranoia, insecurity, which turns into a reality in our minds, which turns into a reality out there. They don't like me. They didn't say hello. They didn't see me. They didn't... No, I was just really busy. I didn't even notice you. Not that I don't love you and care. I just didn't know. But that paranoia comes from an unresolved yesterday. And the Bible's principle here is, listen, don't let the sun go down with that thing. Why? And do not give the devil a foothold. So apparently, just so we're clear... Our spiritual enemy only comes to do three things, steal, kill, and destroy. He don't come to help you out. He don't come to open up a door to make your life better. He only comes to do three things. He wants to tear your family apart. He wants to ruin your relationships. He wants to stunt your growth in Christ so you feel like God is in in control, so you, you feel like God doesn't want to be bothered with you, and you will never become what Christ intended when you give the enemy a foothold by having an unresolved yesterday. All the enemy does is come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. Those are his three motives. And apparently, giving the enemy a foothold, a little crack in the window, a little sliver in the door, apparently comes from not resolving an issue in a timely manner. And we start picking up baggage that we were never meant to carry. Sometimes we get overloaded from an unview unhealthy view of ourself. Yeah, God's not answering my prayer. Let me tell you what I did three years ago. <laughs> I, I said so-and-so two weeks ago. I did X. I participated in blank. You wouldn't believe, Pastor. You ever hear this? Oh, man. You don't want me to come to church, Pastor. The walls will fall in. <laughs> Brother, there's hope. I'm your pastor. unhealthy view of yourself. God doesn't, God doesn't want me involved. God doesn't desire for me to invite him into every area of my life. God's got a lot of other things to worry about than me. My little thing. We pick up baggage because we have this unhealthy sense of ourselves on not ourselves to ourselves, but how we believe God sees us. Very simple. The only accurate way to understand ourselves, to really understand size you and I up, the only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. What? You can read that and go home. (laughs) The only accurate way, so all the other ways are inaccurate. The only accurate way to size you and I up is by what God is and by what he does for us. God loving me has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with him. God loving me has nothing to do with me. God loving me has everything to do with who he is. It's his nature. It's in his DNA. For God so, what? Gave the world. He gives. He's fundamentally defined by love and giving. (laughs) However, we live in a society that is transactional. So what I do for you, you do for me. What I do for you, then you do for me. And if I don't do for you, then you must not do for me. (laughs) That's not kingdom thinking. 
and we have this unhealthy sense of ourselves and we wind up picking up this baggage that overloads us and brings us beyond capacity because we have, we, we have just have an unhealthy sense of who told you, listen, I get all freaked out. Who told you God didn't love you? Who told you? That you don't belong in his house with all your sinful nature, all of my sinful nature, with all your bad thoughts, with all my bad thoughts. Who told you you don't belong in his house? Because the Bible doesn't say it, and that's his voice for us today. So I am sorry that a religious institution or some Christian freak or some televangelist or some ill-equipped, cajoling, self-serving pastor told you that. That is not the gospel of Christ. That is not. It doesn't mean that we are who we are supposed to be and who he created us to be. But the sure way we turn from glory to glory to glory, from transformation to transformation to transformation is in his presence. And his presence is for sure in his house. I'm, I just, listen, see for me, I just put down that bag. It's just so good. I was carrying a little bit of that around. doesn't mean what you're doing is right sometimes in your life. What you're saying is right. Of course not. But where else are you going to figure it out? Watching Oprah? Yeah. <laughs> Chupac, whatever that guy's name. Who's that guy? Chupac Chopra, whatever his name is. God, he freaks me out. <laughs> Can you do me a favor this week? All right, listen. Here's a bunny trail. We're going to have some fun. You ready? Can you do me, some, do me a favor? Go look that guy up online. Okay, and listen to what he says. All he's done is taken thousand year old godly biblical principles and turned them around in his language to make it look like it's new and improved and make it some self help human bumbo jumbo that'll confuse you. What he says that's good was already said by Christ himself thousands of years ago. I saw an episode where he says, forgiveness, forgiveness is the most beautiful thing you can do. Dude, seriously? <laughs> Thousands of years ago said, listen, it's going to be really hard for me to forgive you if you can't forgive your brother. My father in heaven forgive." Thousands of years ago. And we listen to it and we go, oh, genius. It's unbelievable. It's unreal. And we buy into that aspect and when we buy into that aspect, then when he says something unbiblical and how we weren't created to live, we buy that too. That's the deception of the enemy and that's how it works. All right, I got to get back on track. The only accurate way, so many times, I'm not done, so many times we turn I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask somebody I know. I'm going to ask my friends that are my friends because they did this on my Facebook. I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask them about my marriage. How do I fix this man? How do I fix this woman? Woman, you don't fix them. You fix yourself first. What? We hear that all kind of psychology. You got to work on you. You got to work on you. You got to work on you first. Is that a speck in your eye? Take the speck out of your eye first. Then, thousands of years ago, Jesus said this. Thousands of years ago, guys. Stop buying into all this self-help crap. Because, the, I'm, I'm, listen, listen. I'm fired up on this series. Because what it causes us to do is pick up this baggage. And God is saying, I want to lift you up. Nothing else. But you got to unload some stuff. And we have a bad self-image because we don't really believe this scripture that him accepting us, him wanting us close, that if we draw close to him, he draws close to us. We don't really believe that. We believe that it's contingent upon our behavior and our language and that is not the gospel. And we pick up baggage that weighs us down and overloads us because we have a poor self-image of how God sees us. Oh, you don't want none of this. You don't want none of that. <laughs> Can I just tell you the biggest spiritual growth 
in my life has come. See, we get overloaded because we have unrepented sin in our life. It weighs us down. Now, let me give you this. We're overloaded in life. <laughs> I didn't say unforgiven sin. The scripture doesn't say unforgiven sin. This message didn't say unforgiven sin. We're way down. It doesn't say unconfessed sin. What happens a lot of times when I first started getting into to, to like how God wanted to be involved in my life individually, not denomination, not religion, was I didn't know the difference. I literally would come into the house of God, light a couple of candles, say five Hail Marys, seven Our Fathers, and I'm good. <laughs> and I would leave and be like, dude, I'm right, bro. This is awesome. This is awesome. It's unrepented. It's not unconfessed. The Bible is very, very specific. It says that if you are faithful, if you are transparent, I'm paraphrasing, that if you confess your sins, he is just to forgive you. Amen. And we're not talking about unconfessed sins. We're talking about unrepented sins because repentance in the Bible, repentance in the Bible means to turn. It's a word called teshuva. And it means to turn. So many of us, you and me, us, we, us, you and I, come into God's house and we know we said and we know we did some things wrong. Ah, and we know it and we confess it. So it's confessed and it's forgiven. And then we go back out of the house of God and we don't make a move. We don't make a change. We don't turn from what caused us to sin. It's unrepented sin. It's not unconfessed sin or unforgiven sin. It's the sin that lingers because we don't make a behavior change. And what happens is we keep picking up the same stuff. And it overloads us. We can't have the family God wants for us. We can't be the leader in the home. We can't be in the marketplace and make a difference for the kingdom. We're beyond capacity. Because we're carrying stuff we were never meant to carry. And a lot of it comes from just... How do we unload the baggage of disappointment? How do we unload the baggage of guilt and shame? How do we unload fear and anxiety? How do we unload negative pessimism? How do we unload continually an addiction or an appetite? That's what we're going to do for the next four or five weeks. But I wanted us to see what begins to overload us, how we get overloaded. And the way we're going to do it is this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. That's a battle to get rid of this stuff. It's a battle every day, and some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the weapons we fight that with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, you can look, you got a, a, a baggage of disappointment, of anger, of resentment. <laughs> you think you're fixing that with some self-help? You think you're fixing that by reading a book? Could help. But you ain't truly going to get rid of it until you fight it. It's a spiritual issue. Everything is spiritual because you are a spiritual being. We're trying to fight earthly issues. We're trying to fight spiritual issues, excuse me, spiritual issues with earthly weapons. That's what that scripture means. You having a spirit on you, around you, that influences you. Your baggage of disappointment makes you bitter and nasty and terse. That's a spiritual issue. And that's what the scripture says. How are we going to unload this stuff? We're going to go after it for the next four or five weeks. But we're going to deal with spiritual weapons. So that we learn to put this down so that in the journey, he can take me and lift me to where he wants me to be. So I'm not overloaded and over capacity. 
The weapons that we fight with, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Here we go. Stronghold. That's creepy, Pastor Q. Stronghold. Because there are four times more Greek words, New Testament written in, predominantly Greek. There are four times more Greek words, sometimes than English words. You've got to go back to the origin of the word. How we're going to deal with our problems spiritually, our spiritual weapons. And the Bible says that they have the power, spiritual weapons have the power to demolish strongholds. A stronghold is from the word called okurama. And it means a prisoner locked by deception. Huh. God doesn't want to be involved in my life because of what I said or what I did. Deception. And you act like it and you make behavior decisions based on a non-truth. I was hurt 10 years ago by my parents and by a bad relationship. And I don't know if I can find healing. I don't know if the Lord wants to make me whole. Okurama. Spiritual weapons we use can demolish okurama. It's a prisoner. And some of us are prisoners based on a lie. Some of us are prisoners based on a lie. See, somebody's got something that we're trying to fix with the earthly stuff. But it's a spiritual issue. And the Bible says we'll use spiritual weapons. It says a prisoner locked by deception. Living life by something is not true. It's not true. It's not true that you can't be healed. It's not true that God doesn't want to hear from you. It's not true God doesn't want you close to you. It's not true he can't, you can't make it through the season you're in. It's not, it's not true. But we believe it is though because we have a stronghold. It attaches itself to us somehow. The disposition and behavior and appetite, it constantly attaches itself to us. And then when we try to go on this journey, we're overloaded and beyond capacity. And so if Okurama is living life by a lie, what we're going to do for the next four or five weeks is we're going to replace the lie with the truth of his word. And now you can choose. And now you can choose. So if, if, if a stronghold, things that attach themselves to me and make me over capacity, well, then what we're going to do is we're going to replace the lie of doubt and fear, and anxiety, the lie of shame and guilt, the lie of addiction, the lie of all these things we're going to replace with the truth so that you can be free to a point where you can go right to your capacity of where God wants to bring you. Amen. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do for the next four or five weeks. I will lose 10 pounds during this. I'm sweating like a stuck pig. All right, listen. I love you guys. May you be found. May you be found in God's house. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. And Lord, I know already that your spirit is moving through our doubt, fear, shame, guilt, hurt, pain. It's moving, Lord, and it's unearthing some hard areas of our heart. We pray that you continue to do that and bring us back together next week where we were created to be found in your house and in your presence. Lord, we believe in your Holy Spirit that moves and draws men closer. Not because of my words, Lord, but because the power of your voice through your word. Lord, watch over us this week. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks again for watching this week's message. If you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can do so by giving on the chapel website, thechapel.cc, and use the give button that's located in the upper right-hand corner. Hey, we love being your church, and we'll see you next week.